Can't. Please, thank you. Is that better? Yes, it is. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, this is one of the final sessions, but I want to emphasize the importance of this session. And um, really thank you all for being with us this afternoon. Let's go through the panel. My name is Julie Gishuru. I work in the media in Nairobi. And uh, I'm a passionate African woman, a mother, a wife, a daughter. Um, seated right next to me, uh, I'm happy to introduce the Minister of Petroleum Resources of Nigeria, Diazani Alison Madweke. I hope I've said it right. Fine. Close enough. <laughs> Good. And she, of course, has blazed the trail in Nigeria, and she's been at the helm of several ministries. We'll hear more from her in just a short while. Right next to her is Kenneth Fraser, who's the chairman, president, and CEO of Merck and Co. He's going to tell us about best business practices in his organization and more as well. Um, seated right next to him is Sheila Sisulu. Now, Sheila actually heads, um, no, is Deputy Executive Director of the United Nations World Food Program. Um, seated next to Sheila is, uh, of course, a, a co-chair of the World Economic Forum on Africa. It's Donald Kaberuka, and he is President of the Africa Development Bank. Next to him, we have uh, Monhla Mon Khlakhla. And uh, Monla is the chairperson of Industrial Development Corporation of South Africa, also a co-chair of the World Economic uh, Forum. And next to her is Charlotte Osei, who chairs the National Commission for Civic Education, and that's in Ghana. So let's give them all a big hand for being with us this afternoon. Thank you. Now, you've had access to some of the slides showing the statistics uh, up on the screen. I just want to give you a little bit more. In terms of regional performance, when it comes to health and survival, out of six regions, Africa is second last, only uh, you know, better than Asia and the Pacific. So we're doing very badly in terms of health and survival uh, with the gender gap. Now, when it comes to educational, where do you think we are? Last? No, not last? You're wrong, we're last. <laughs> I'm so sorry to be the bearer of bad news. In terms of uh, education, we're last out of the six regions, which are Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Middle East and North Africa is separate, Asia and the Pacific, Europe and Central Asia, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, and then North America, those are the regions, so we are last. In terms of economic participation, someone tell me, what do you think? Out of six, where do we stand? Six? You think maybe six? Three? I hear from someone. Third? Yes, Swati? Number one? Okay, we're not doing too badly. Let me put it that way. We're number three. Who said three? There we go. Uh, we're number three in terms of economic participation and opportunity. Would you have thought that? That is interesting. Yes, you would. Uh, great. And finally, political empowerment. Where do we stand? Silence, everyone's, everyone's unsure. We're number four, yes, we are number four. So we're, we're not quite at the bottom, but still lots of improvement. And this is from the Global Gender Gap Report that was released just a few weeks ago, and you can access that through the World Economic Forum website. From that, we go straight into the conversation. And I want to start with the minister right next to me. Your journey is very interesting. You've headed several ministries. I think in 2007 was at the Ministry of uh, Transport. And then straight after that, you were moved to another ministry, and uh, that was Mines and Steel Development. That was in 2008. And then 2010 saw you appointed Minister of Petroleum Resources. And before that, you were in private sector. Shell is one of the companies you work for. I'd like you to give us your personal journey but with specific reference to what you feel were the milestones and maybe the best practices that helped propel you forward. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. I think that um, for women, um, over the years, it's been interesting uh, to see the evolution, uh, particularly across Africa. And the fact that um, even though the statistics are dismal, because at this point in time, that same poll shows that the gender gap is actually increasing across Africa. At the same time, I think women are beginning to dig their heels in 
in various sectors and um, to become and are becoming um, quite acceptable um, and applauded across various sectors. I think it has always been difficult, especially when you choose to go into male-dominated sectors. Um, but I have always encouraged more women to go into male-dominated sectors as the only way women will ever begin to come near to dominating those sectors. And over the years, it would probably, unfortunately, not have been possible if uh, one didn't have very strong mentor figures. I say, uh, unfortunately, um, because I would have loved to say that those mentor figures were women, uh, but they were men. And again, I think that's um, um, very educative, uh, because I think that along the way in mentoring younger women, uh, we have continued uh, to sing the song that if one woman succeeds, all women succeed, no matter what you feel about that woman. And that it is incredibly important that as you ascend the ladder, you utilize your leadership positions in mentoring other women and pulling them up as you go along. So yes, I think the mentoring was critical. And women have to mentor other women. Men do it all the time. Men have the stronger networks. Women have to form networks. And I think um, just having to be competitive within male-dominated uh, sectors um, has forced uh, uh, me uh, to move along uh, in the manner that I have. I think that also I have found, for me, it may not work for everybody else, but that um, without losing your femininity in any form, in terms of gender uh, issues, I mean, in the, in the workplace, uh, one has to sort of pull back a little bit from the natural sentimentality, the emotiveness that women have naturally, because women are the nurturers. And in, in workplace, women tend to be the ones who want to be accepted more than men. Uh, so they deal with issues in a somewhat different way. And we do have to actually stand back without, like I say, becoming men and becoming extremely hard and fashion a different way for ourselves to succeed in, in the workplace. That's very interesting and, uh, and a challenge because you're trying to, to be practical, realistic, and mm. remove the motherly instincts and, and the peacemaker instincts sometimes. Mm -hmm. you've, got, you've got to go out there and, and, and be a, a little bit more aggressive. Ken, let me come to you. Um, what are some of the best practices that Merck and Co. have adopted or that you've seen adopted in your environment in the U.S.? Thank you. Let me say at the outset, I'm very pleased to be asked to be on this panel with so many distinguished people. I want to start by saying that uh, while in the U.S. we would claim to value gender diversity, anyone who looks at the number of women running U.S. multinational companies would say that we are, our language is far ahead of our action. So we are not by any means. We talked about women's empowerment in Africa at the beginning. But there's a very, very small number of Fortune 500 companies that have women CEOs, despite the fact that all these companies claim to value diversity. So what I would say about it, Merck is that we recognize we have a gap. That's the first thing I would say. And we're trying to step up to the challenge of that gap. Um, from our perspective, um, we have, a, at the vice presidential level, 25% of our vice presidents are women, but 50% of our employees are women. So there's still, if you can see, a gap there. I would say from the standpoint of best practices, we've done a lot of things around formal mentorship. We've created women's networks so that women can get together to create the kinds of networks that were just referred to. But I do think at the end of the day, the most important thing is whether men in positions of influence and power are willing to sponsor women. When I say sponsor them, I mean two things. I think, first of all, to mentor them personally, to give them informal mentorship, because I think formal mentorship programs are okay up to a point. Uh, but I know, for example, that I have been fortunate to have had very strong relationships with the three prior CEOs at Merck. And I know that those relationships had a lot to do with my being CEO now. Those were informal relationships. They chose to invest in me rather than perhaps other people. So mentorship is the first thing. The second thing around sponsorship is that men have to be aware of the, the way in which men and women interact differentially inside the company. So let me give you an example. I think we've all seen a situation where we have a discussion around the table and a woman has a very important thing to say, but she's unwilling to interrupt. The men are willing to interrupt left and right, and you've often seen the situation where that happens or where a woman makes a point, 
A man comes back a half an hour and makes exactly the same point. And then everybody and applauds everybody says, That's him. a great idea, right? So the second form of it is encouraging women to, to move into leadership roles, either formally by moving them up in the, in the corporation or even within informal working groups to ensure that the women's voices are heard. It's so interesting. Um, I, I, one of the Scandinavian um, leaders right now, a female, said, you know what she does is that when she has an important meeting and wants to make a point, she wears her red dress. <laughs> she wears the red dress, and they will pay attention. <laughs> she, she makes them. Sheila, let me come to you. Let's completely move this conversation to, to the very real grassroots issues from the boardrooms and the offices. Um, let's talk about health and education. And some of the real things that we're seeing on the continent, for instance, girls having to drop out of schools in the most deprived communities. The first people who will suffer are the girl child. They have to stay at home and try to provide for the family. We're seeing things like um, lack of sanitary towels, meaning that for certain days in a term, girls don't go to school. Um, tell us what needs to be done, and are there case studies of what's been applied in terms of health and education that can be adopted across the continent? Um, yeah, thank you for, I, I would say it's not grassroots because I think it affects the boardroom, what I'm going to talk about, okay. uh, education and health. Um, you can only have that number of women, a pool to get from, if they are equally educated and equally healthy as men and have the time to go up the ladder uh, in, in the boardroom. And you miss out in the boardroom if you don't have them. But also... I think we miss out in society. And we begin to miss out very early on in the lives of girls. When a girl is malnourished, particularly around um, adolescence, they are likely, when they become childbearing, to continue to be malnourished because some of the um, conditions that they, they get are not reversible. And the statistics show that a, a woman who gives birth, a woman who is malnourished who gives birth, their child is likely 40% to die before age five. And that woman stands, women tend 10% chance of dying at childbirth, giving birth because they are malnourished. Yeah. So the, the point is you have to start early. You have to start early to make sure that the girl child has equal chances at health and therefore equal chances at education. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the time, the dropout rate at, in the early years among girls is actually because of hunger. They are the ones who have to make sure, they are the ones who have to give up something so that boys can go to school so that everybody else can eat. So they get to drop out of school. <laughs> I'm very happy to say that the latest uh, uh, UNDP um, uh, report shows that Africa is catching up on entrance of children, of girl children, to primary education. The bottleneck begins in high school. Mm -hmm. And yet statistics show that a girl child who spent one extra year in high school will earn 10% more than one who doesn't spend that extra year in high school. So, Guess what? That one who earns 10% more is a spender, mm -hmm. is a consumer. So it's important that the boardroom recognizes that you're losing out as well. Mm -hmm. But governments in particular, in a study in Latin America, we found that governments in general were losing in the range of 1% to 11% of GDP per annum because of child undernutrition. That was more than 6 billion US dollars per annum in some countries. So it's, it is grassroots, but if we don't nip it in the bud, we tend to pay the price later. So make sure that the girl children have equal chance to education, but they are healthy so that they are there as a pool from which you can draw talent. If they are dead, they're dead. Wow. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, Donald, let me come to you now. Uh, before your chapter at Africa Development Bank began, you played a key role in the reconstruction 
of Rwanda, and Rwanda is a critical ex example of what we can do right to empower women in political leadership, for instance, but also right across, I, I know, uh, the different sectors. Uh, looking at your parliament, it's majority women right now. My question is, was that strategic? Was this a focus when you were looking at how to rebuild the country? Um, preface this by saying that yesterday we spent a lot of time talking about this new Africa which is a new momentum and many of us wondered how sustainable that is and you recall the answer given was among other things the new momentum in Africa is only sustainable if it is inclusive and you recall that uh, we mentioned some of the elements of inclusiveness small businesses uh, getting children of the poor in quality education and agriculture. I think we should have added that on all three small businesses, keeping children of the poor at school to avoid this intergenerational transmission of poverty and agriculture, particular attention must be given to gender issues. This is what sustainability of Africa's momentum, this is what it will take. So it is a big issue. It is not simple about uh, implementing an agenda we know, now it is even more urgent than ever before. Because it will influence the future trajectory of the continent. The second reason is that uh, between now and 2040 or 50, people have said it, Africa is experiencing a window of opportunity which will go away. And that is a window which the jargon they call the demographic dividend. We have an opportunity now because of the structure of the labor force, because of the balance between the retirees and the young people, the triangle, the demographic dynamics, a chance for Africa to do what Asia did between 1970 and 2000, which was to take advantage of the young people, women and men, and bolster Asia's growth. So for me, these are two big issues. Now, where I see as head of the African Development Bank, uh, I'm not certain we do things right. Each time I finance an energy project, I wonder uh, what this means for women small businesses. Uh, each time we finance an agricultural project, we wonder whether this is taking place. So I'm happy to learn from here of what we can do better. Mm -hmm. And uh, things we are doing wrong, I'm happy to eat humble pie. Right. Yeah, my friend Sheila keeps telling me that there are things we can do better, for sure. Now, vis-a-vis -vis Rwanda, I left Rwanda seven years ago, so I'm no longer a minister. Uh, but I think the finance minister of Rwanda is here, he may be about help us. My take is the following. This is how we reasoned in government. Mm -hmm. uh, the tragedy in my country was a result of two things. Uh, bad governance and exclusion. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're trying to heal a nation which has suffered because of bad governance and exclusion, you must begin by doing the opposite. And so we reason that we cannot reconstruct that country unless we have a fully inclusive agenda. And we begin by saying inclusive agenda begins with every Rwanda, man and woman, equal rights. So we began by changing the laws of the country, which we thought were backward, articulating clearly in policies what had to be done. You know what? We, when we came to power, the 1994, that is, the country had about, if I recall the numbers, about 600,000 orphans. Yeah, 600, that about. But if you go to Rwanda today, you never find an orphanage. No orphanage in Rwanda because all the children were adopted by families and those were the women uh, taking the lead. So there was also a role in national reconciliation, in healing justice, that kind of stuff. And so these things have taken roots. In Rwanda today, we don't ask why women are appointed as uh, ministers or army commanders or police commanders. It's not a big issue for us. The big issue now is implementation and making sure that best practice can be uh, scaled up. I'm not by any chance saying that we have done everything right. There are many things we still have to do. But I think there are some lessons which can be learned uh, for other countries uh, coming out of conflict. Thank you. I think in all honesty, Rwanda has probably uh, lifted our performance <laughs> on the gender gap. Uh, we know where many African countries stand. So. That is for sure. Let, let me come to you, Monla, now, and, and back to the private sector. 
What would you like to see today implemented in corporations, in companies, whether they're small, medium, large, uh, to help empower the woman? Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I think it's important to convince you why you should particularly look at women in Africa. Giving the example of South Africa's population, for example, of about 50 million people, 56% are female. And of the 1 billion population of Africa, I bet my life after war, HIV, our households are largely led by women. Which means that when we talk about feminization of poverty, if you look at the statistics of poverty, the chances are therefore higher that the majority of the poor are female. Therefore, every program that we all try to do about the future of Africa, about how to make Africa more vibrant, if statistically I'm correct, you will agree with me then that the women have to be in the center because then we can deal with the issues properly. And as a result, some of the propositions I have, we have seen and tested them and other parts of the world have tested them as well. The first one, which really for me, it's more about government as well as about corporations. Is what is called gender responsive budgeting. And I'm pleased to see in the audience that Dr. Precious Muller is here because she's beginning from her foundation in South Africa to agree with the government of South Africa. If this tool that says, let's check for all of our budget for the country to see what the impact of the outputs that we said we are designing has on women, has on men, so that we can check that we are actually dealing with the level of poverty or we are removing the level of bottlenecks in them. Imagine if every government in Africa, when they check their performance, among all the performance indicators, you are able to do a gender responsive review to see what happens to girl child, boy child, because it's not about one or the other, but because of the majority of women, particularly we want to see that we are making a difference in there. Even companies can, so that when they want to see that they are making sustainable outcomes, they can also check the same thing, particularly because Africa is so feminine. In addition, and I think this has already been said, it is important that we create role models. In South Africa, I'm probably one of the people that could say I'm proud that there was a program to make sure that young black women are brought into business and 10 years on, having been the CEO of the airports company in South Africa and today chairing the IDC, I would hope that for a younger woman seeing in a rural village from where I come from in Limpopo, they realize that actually I don't have to be a subsistent farmer forever. I can go to school and maybe the opportunities that are available to me are many because I can see a face like me doing something different. We've got to create as many women as possible, both in government, in business, in various layers and give them the mentorship as it has been mentioned and importantly create a network so that the networks gives the women a power base to be engaging in the formal systems that are available today. The last point which I should also add, I think there are many things that we, we could say around it. Um, I stumbled upon Bangladesh having a university created by philanthropists, and some of them are involved in the World Economic Forum, on a university on entrepreneurship for women who have been in war in Asia. Because there were so many young women and so many orphans who, by the way, in the most developed, the developing countries, at large, I would assume, an old lady will carry all of them. They take those youngsters and they teach them and they mentor them and they coach them to start doing some entrepreneurial activities to be ready to partner with you. I think because I know you measure well. Test if my theory is not correct. That in all likelihood, the Africa we talk about and dream about 
require that even the programs of the World Economic Forum begin to say, if we want to test 10 years from now that the dream has happened, what happened to the African woman? Thank you, Monla, for that. Charlotte, I come to you with the very real issues of culture and uh, the perceptions that the woman, uh, in, in the research it shows in terms of economic participation, she's not doing badly, but the truth is she's a breadwinner and can't break far past that. So it's subsistence earning. Um, in many places, some might say the cultures are holding her back. Um, how important is civic education in this whole process? How important is it to get the buy-in of community? Or is that whole concept a cop-out? Over to you, Charlotte. When, when it comes to um, the issue of women taking leadership roles in business and in, um, in politics in Africa... Can we hear? Can you move your mic a little bit closer to you? Thank you. When it comes to the issue of women taking a leadership role in politics and in business in Africa, there are a lot of cop-outs, not just culture. Um, I, I keep thinking to myself, when technology became so important to business, no one had any forum trying to convince business people why they should invest in technology to, to increase the profitability of their businesses. They did it. Governments are investing in technology to use it to close the digital divide, increase their GDP. We have hardcore scientific research that shows that Africa cannot move forward without women. Businesses stand to profit when they invest in women. Why do women still have to try to convince um, political leaders and business leaders that they have to invest in women and it's to their own benefit? And it comes to a mindset issue, and it starts with the women. We come to the business sphere and to the political circles very apologetic. We are so grateful to have a foot in the door that we, we don't even complain when the door is only half open and then they fling it wide for the next man. So it starts from there. It's also a mindset issue because we've talked about role models. But the women who have been given the opportunity, who have been, had the privilege of education and of being in leadership positions, do we appreciate that we are role models to other women? Do we appreciate that we represent a distinct constituency of women? I've had meetings with women in parliament in my country, and we've tried to tell them that, yes, you are there, you are representing a political party, but you also represent a constituency of other women. You need to go beyond the political divide and help other women, bring them into the circle. It, the message is not getting through, so it's a mindset thing. And yes, we need to see women in leadership because it also helps men understand that women can perform when they are given the opportunity. And that's where the culture comes in. They will always use culture as the excuse, but I think it's just that, it's an excuse. I did a, an LLM thesis on um, women in the Akan customary setting. The Akans are the largest ethnic tribes in Ghana. And if you research it, you'll find that in traditional Akan society, women were the kingmakers, women were kings. Women um, held very strong positions, even in terms of um, dispute resolution and all that. The children belong to women in the Akan setting. It doesn't get any stronger than that. However, when you try and put it into modern day business and politics, the Akan proverb still holds true that a woman may hold a gun, may own a gun, but it will lean against a man's house. There's always something trying to push us right back in there. And so it has to be a mindset thing. Mm -hmm. And for me, the only way we can get women in leadership positions in business and in government is the same strategies. We must legislate it. Mm -hmm. It took a disaster in Bangladesh, it took a disaster in Rwanda, but it had to be legislated. Mm -hmm. It's sad that it only takes a disaster for us to see why we should include women. But we have to legislate it. Mm -hmm. We have to put quotas. The countries where it's worked, Finland, um, Sweden, South Africa, is because there were quotas and they were enforced. If we start by enforcing it in businesses, you must have this number of women at the top before, otherwise you'll be sanctioned. Then businesses will listen because businesses don't want to pay penalties. People like Donald have to make it a policy. If we're going to give you a facility, we must see what are you doing, concrete steps to put women in there. The banks like African Development Bank must support sustained formal mentoring programs. 
It can't be ad hoc. It has to be formal. It has to be sustained. Women have to be mentored by other women and by men for them to come into leadership. Okay, I'm, I'm coming to, in a moment to your questions and comments. Sheila wanted to jump in. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, and no, okay. I just okay. wanted to, to pick up on, on, on what was said earlier about um, can't hear Sheila. The, the culture. Closer to the mic, please, Sheila. Yes. <laughs> just closer to the mic. Just oh, closer. Okay, yes. okay. So, okay, sorry. <laughs> I wanted to, to pick up on the issue of uh, culture as a cop-out. I think the notion that cultural practices hold women back. In the private sector, in the corporate world, I think it has been proven to be a cop-out, especially when it comes to Africa. Example, South Africa, Rwanda, we've heard. In the private sector, in, in, in the public sector in South Africa, in the state-owned enterprises, in parliament, in cabinet, the number of women in those sectors has gone up. If I can count five, up to five, women CEOs in the corporate world in South Africa, that will be too many. And that's not different in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yes, we have to fight cultural norms, women, girl circumcision, and, and, and we have to fight against those. And, and, and help girls be relieved out of, re released out of that kind of bondage. But I don't think there are too many women who are circumcised in America. And why are they not CEOs? <laughs> you know? Uh, so I think we need to look at the culture of excluding women. And that culture can be assisted, I want to say to my sisters, by actually having men champions. Yes. That's one. Two, I think it was said also again, that we women need to stop being shy about being women in the boardroom. Bring our womanhood into the boardroom, whatever that means for you. But don't be apologetic and try to emulate the men. Because why be there if you're going to emulate them? You know. I think we bring something different. Identify what that is and bring it to the fore. And importantly, keep the door open for your sisters. Don't leave them out. Thank you. Dear Zani, please go ahead. I just wanted to um, follow on from what Chris uh, uh, pointed out in terms of the necessity for legislation uh, to underscore um, economic empowerment for women. Because there are some... Sorry? They can't hear. Oh. I wanted to underscore what Chris had mentioned in terms of legislation, which I think is necessary uh, to underscore economic empowerment uh, for women uh, fundamentally. I think that as we make um, our economic policies going forward, we do have to look at uh, a number of basic parameters. For instance, I think cutting across all uh, African countries, uh, you will find that market, market access for women at the fundamental you know, level is quite difficult, is constrained for quite a number of obvious reasons, such as inability to access capital. Um, a lot of donor uh, companies give a lot of funding to micro-enterprises. But in fact, the major issue is going from a micro-enterprise to an actual SME, and actually encouraging growth um, with women at the fundamental level. We found um, many times, even in the private sector, that when we give microcredit, um, and I'm sure everybody will agree with me here, uh, it is the women, especially in the rural areas, that do fantastically well with it. They take up the projects, they do them, they return with a profit, and then they take a bigger loan. You know, and we encourage that. But we need to bridge the gap between moving them from microcredit and microenterprise to actually small to medium enterprises that can take root and begin to actually affect the economies of the countries in which um, they, they run. Then property rights, because we know that culturally there are a lot of issues with property rights for women across Africa. Mm -hmm. I think even governments have to look very closely at these issues and how to ensure that women, because it's very difficult to maintain a sustained business if you don't have the ability to access property in the first place mm -hmm. for various uh, um, reasons. I think that is fundamentally very important as well. 
I see hands going up, but we must go to the floor and we will be right back. So um, there's a question right here on the end, please. Another mic can be given to the gentleman over here and then, then the lady here at the front. Um, go ahead, please. Tell us your name. Tell us what you do very briefly and then ask your question. Okay. Uh, my name is Chief Ipa Mohango. I'm a chief economist for Asra Metal, South Africa. Uh, I think mine is not necessarily a question, but maybe just general comments that I would like to, maybe if there's anything, maybe uh, the panel can comment. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I was coming in here, someone asked me to say, oh, why, what are you doing here? I mean, this is a uh, women affair. It's a women's. Uh, it's a women affair. <laughs> and uh, I said, I'm going to answer you inside here. So I'm coming from an institution where it's led by a woman, CEO. My boss is a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked for a company called IDC. Uh, where the first, uh, I mean, one of the, your predecessor was a woman, and I'm happy that no, she, a continuity has, has happened where there's still a woman as a chairperson of IDC. The other thing is that I was born in Malawi, and we've got a woman president right here, so to speak. <laughs> but then, when you come to discussing the issues of women, where it even touches me even much further is that I've got two children, and both of them are girls. So the discussion about women, it's not about it's a political, uh, governmental, or whatever you can call it. To me, it's a family affair that as men, I think we need to take charge and lead our girls to, 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 to make sure that no, there are no boundaries in terms of aspirations. The issues that, if you have been following issues from Malawi, mm -hmm. you realize that no, the turbulence are still there on the political side when it comes to women transcending mm -hmm. towards not only being ministers, but I think being presidents. Mm -hmm. And my suggestion is very easy. I think we need an intervention on the political side when it comes to the constitution. Where if we can manipulate our constitution to say, uh, politically, where you say, this person, if you, if you are from this region, therefore the next play, the, the, the vice must be from this other province, or a Christian somewhere, and then the <laughs> second must be a, 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 a whatever, a Muslim. Yes. Why can't we do the same with women? Thank you, thank you. Um, please pass the mic to the lady here in the middle, if, if you would. And I just, I just want to say the, the one who birthed you was also a woman. So thank you for being here. We'll go to the lady next and then the gentleman at the back. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. My name is Patricia Francis. I'm the executive director of the International Trade Center, which is a joint agency of the UN and the WTO. What we have found is that, uh, because we're focused on trade, is that there are fundamental, just as the minister from Nigeria said, fundamental issues which exclude women. And the first premise is when diagnostic studies are being done. Diagnostic studies are being done, women's issues are not being taken into account in the diagnostic studies, and therefore they're never taken into account in implementation. And this is one of the fundamental things that we have been working with our partners on trade issues to ensure that one, that you diagnose them in the, in the beginning and that they're actually there in the action matrix. The second and important thing is about counting what happens and having the data, this disaggregated data, to ensure that you're actually seeing what has happened from the beginning to the end. And that this is critical and important. And what we've done in our agency is that we have certainly mandated that we have to count in every project that we're working in what is the impact on women. And, and that can be everything from how many attended uh, and participated in some, some activities that we were in, or how, what is the outcome and the impact of our, our activities on women. So I think that this is critical and important. But economic empowerment of women, I think, is the most fundamental from our perspective. And it is correct that 70% of the, of, of the poor are women. And therefore, if you haven't thought about women, you're not going to, to correct poverty. And, and so this is critical. And I think that going forward, if everyone were to, uh, were to actually measure and set targets and report on it, that we would be in a place 10 years from now to come back and actually say what we've accomplished. What the gains are. Thank you so much. Please go ahead. OK, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Bello Okello, and I'm the regional representative for the International Center for Research on Women, based in Nairobi. Uh, I agree with everything that has been said before, and I want to just make one or two observations, if you allow me, Julie, that the first and uh, for the, one of the most important things we need to do is not 
to really go and bombard women with all these issues about women and their rights. In my perspective, and I was told this by a Maasai woman grandmother 20 years ago, that you guys keep, here, keep coming, taking us to the workshops, but we are not the problem. The problem are you, the men. So I want to challenge the men who are here, and I want to challenge those who have resources, that can you try and give a little bit of this civic education to the men to see their wives as partners. Their wife, I mean, you have to treat your wives as if you're treating your daughter, as if you're treating your sister, not as an enemy in the household. <laughs> Secondly, uh, a lot has been said about the issue of uh, representation uh, activ uh, activities and benefits. I would like to uh, request the two gentlemen seated there and Madam CEO that the first thing you need to do when you are going to fund any program is to have what I call uh, a gender responsive programming. Unfortunately, we must have this coming with some data as she has said. And lastly, I would like to say that uh, it is important for you to walk the talk. We need data to support some of these things, and it's incumbent upon you to support those who want to give the data, who want to show the way, what works and what doesn't work, so that we move ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let, let me take a question on this side, please, if the mic could come uh, to the gentleman on this side. And I see gentlemen with their hands up. I'll be back to you in a moment. No ladies. There's a lady there. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Zola. So see, I'm the chairman of ESCOM, South Africa. Ooh. I just want to solicit a comment from my brother Donald in relation to the issue of uh, gender-sensitive procurement strategies. What, what is gender-sensitive yeah. gender procurement? Gender-sensitive yeah. procurement strategies. Mm -hmm. We at, uh, at, at ESCOM have worked very hard in this field, in this area, and we believe that in a transformational approach to procurement that is directed at the upliftment of women and women in business, there is a lot that we have learned. And I think that it would do well for the African Development Bank also to begin to show some interest and some way of differentiating is procurement strategies so that it can attract the potential that exists in the field of women business, women in business. So I would certainly like to get a comment from you in that regard. Okay. And That's we certainly have done quite a bit of work in that area ourselves. Okay, Donald, we'll, we'll address that in just a few moments. I want the lady here to ask a question, then we'll take a second round of questions in just a short while, please. Thank you. Uh, sorry, the lady, the lady right here uh, in front, just yes. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Yvonne Ike, CEO for West Africa Renaissance Capital. Um, I've come here and I'm challenged by us still as women looking for men to approve us and give us the empowerment we need to move forward. And I think one important takeaway, there's enough powerful women in the world, there's enough powerful women at this forum, that one important takeaway is for women to get together and start to work on some of these initiatives and just demand what we know works and start to take one, two, three of them, not many, and start, I mean, there's Jennifer here who's ITC. There's seven billion dollars of trade, seven, seven billions of dollars of trade that could go to women, uh, women who are trading. Let's get together with her, let's start doing things and let's stop giving men civil education, asking men to legislate <laughs> information from us and right. let's get on with it. Right, let's just do it. Is this <laughs> Thank you. We're going to come back. We're going to come back in just a short while to more questions. Uh, let me start with you, Charlotte, on that end. Please. I, I completely agree with what she's saying. The men are not going to do it. In Ghana... Well, they might, but why wait? <laughs> why wait? You see, in Ghana, we, 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 we had a constitution that came into effect in 1993, January. And that constitution contains one provision that is, I've always found very amazing in the way it's played out. It says that as soon as practicable, after this constitution comes into effect, Parliament should pass a law which would ensure the equal distribution of matrimonial property upon divorce. We're almost 20 years into our constitution. Parliament has not found the time to pass that law. It's only in February of this year that there was a Supreme Court panel, majority female, and they said there was a matrimonial property issue, 
and they said, you know, we're going to use the constitutional provision, equality is equity, and we're going to give the woman half. 20 years, Parliament has not been able to pass that law. Domestic violence was an issue in Ghana until the government set up a, 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 a unit of the police that dealt with domestic violence and child maintenance issues. Immediately, throughout Ghana, all the men knew that, oh, if you do this, there are sanctions. Then the numbers started dropping. We can't keep waiting and begging. We're too apologetic about things that belong to us as of right. Also, the big issue is that when you talk across African governments, when they come to WEF, because gender is on the table, they will speak to it. But it is not actually on the table. And the one thing I know about politicians, if something is not an election issue, it doesn't matter to politicians. We have to put this issue, if it is that important, we have to come together as women, make it an election issue, at least in Africa, and put it on the table, because everywhere else, that's what works. Thank you. Mona, I think you wanted to come in as well, and please, she, she's addressed it. Donald, you had a question. So procurement. How, how do you think that would work with the Africa Development Bank? Would it be possible to take some lessons from Exxon, I think it is? Julie, this is uh, it's something I would like to, to take forward. Um, not we alone, but other uh, development finance institutions. But I cannot pretend that there are not issues around there which have to be addressed. Legal issues. Uh, because when we do procurement, it is international competitive bidding. And uh, this is also important as a principle in itself. But there are, I think, uh, best practices to learn from. And I would like to report back maybe uh, next time. Julie, if you can hold my feet to the fire and ask okay. me next time. But, okay. but could I say two things, though? Uh, Frankly, I think that it would be a pity if uh, this kind of debate ended up as men against women. It would be a shame. Uh, we are in this together. Yeah. Maybe we are not getting it right, <laughs> but we are in this both together. Uh, let me give an example. Uh, Sheila mentioned this uh, report by UNDP. One of the successes we must celebrate, all of us, is the fact that the MDG about equity in school enrollment between boys and girls is one where many African countries have scored high. Mm -hmm. That is a celebration. But now we have the next challenge. It's not simply the numbers. We need those girls to stay at school like the boys, get a quality education, because that is a starting point. Yeah. And this will have, you can have women conferences, of course, but I think it's much better if we're all in the same room and discussing these challenges together. Second point I think I should like to raise is that um, it's a pity the founder of uh, New Faces, New Voices is not here, uh, Grace Michelle. Yes. Uh, she's not here, but uh, many people in this room and I have been working with her in terms of uh, empowering business women to access finance in a meaningful way. And I think those kind of programs we would like to pursue further okay. to try to bring them up to scale. But Julie, I want to urge you that this is not about men against women. Right. It's not against our sons against our daughters. It is all of us in the same boat. That boat has to go to the right place at the right speed. That is all. Thank you. Uh, you know, I just want to emphasize as, as a girl who grew up with four rough brothers and a woman who has had four sons and one daughter, that I totally agree that we've got to move together. Um, but... I need to emphasize, I've had this kind of discussion several times, and there's always someone at the back of the room who puts their hand up and stands up and says, women want things without working for them. You know, there's always someone who stands up and says that. So there is a section of society that believes that when women ask for their equal rights or push for they them, should. that they're demanding more than they should have. And this is a candid, this is just, this is what is real. But Sheila, let me come to you. Yeah, no, no, I just wanted to... to say that women mobilizing to have a powerful voice is not contradictory to having men as partners and champions. It is not contradictory. In fact, I think in some instances it has been counterproductive to approach issues as men and women issues. HIV and AIDS is one such mistake we made. Mm. We took women to workshops, we educated them about negotiating safe sex and all those things. And the men 
felt that they were made to be feel responsible, they were the perpetrators, and the others were the victims. Yet, on this one, men and women are in it together, and yet we separate them and cause them to be, uh, you know, almost uh, locking heads on this one. So I, I think, absolutely, organize, organize, organize. Women need to organize and have a greater voice. But we have to have men in our corner, not because we're being apologetic, but because it ta it's 50-50. We, we need to push, we need to educate them, as somebody said, that they stand to benefit if their daughters become self-sufficient, self get the jobs, lead the country, become presidents, and so forth. They are not losing anything. We're not pushing anybody aside. We're making it even better and more whole. Can I just finally say on the issue of data? And I want to talk about incentives. Data is all very well. It's after the fact. I think we need to ensure that those that have the money have the incentives. It could be legislation, the necessary incentives to say, yeah, we won't buy from you if your company, and this, this happens in, it's called BEE in South Africa, procurement by government insists that there be not only a gender balance, which they haven't won yet, but at least that those who are privileged before and those who are newly liberated should share in the procurement by government. So it's not only Kabaruka, it's all of, the, of those who are procuring or getting contracts and deals, and the UN is not an exception. We must also insist when you procure, because in WFP, we procure almost a billion dollars of food in Africa for Africa per year. Almost a billion US dollars. We have started a project where we are purchasing from smallholder farmers because we're told the majority are women. Guess what? When we have to buy from smallholder farmers, it is so hard to find them because when it comes to now managing the money, the men jump into the front. <laughs> and the, but the women do the back-breaking work. So I think in procuring as well, mm -hmm. as you've said, we need to insist that who we procure, procure from must represent the society as a whole. Thank you, Ken. I want to come to you with the same issue, procurement, and how private sector can play a key role there as well. Well, I think that's a really important issue. I just want to comment very quickly on your you're aside about men thinking that women don't work hard enough and are wanting something easy. And there was a very well-known American former CEO who made a comment to that effect last week, and it made all the newspapers. And yes. it's really quite extraordinary. If did, one did you see that? Can I ask? Did anybody see the comment that was yeah, made? A couple of hands. Maybe you can, you can tell us what it so was. So the former CEO of, of General Electric, Jack Welch, who's a known as a sort of legendary CEO, was speaking at a women's conference and said that he thought that the real key was for women to, in effect, to work harder and perform better, yeah. and that would make them successful. And I just want to say that I think that um, anybody who takes into consideration the fact that most women have disproportionate responsibilities for managing homes and caring for children could never make the argument that women don't work as hard as men, because the women that I work with often have those responsibilities which are not evenly distributed at home. On the procurement question, I think I'd like to take a step back from it. I think the question is, are there sufficient economic incentives for private companies to promote women? I would argue that the most enlightened companies say the answer is yes. Um, for example, my company, Merck, which is in the business of translating cutting-edge science into medically important products, there are not that many brilliant scientists and engineers in the world such that we can skip women. There are many important women. In fact, our, our most prominent new product, a diabetes product, was discovered by two women. Without that product, our company, I don't know where it is today. So I think there are real economic incentives uh, long term in terms of the war for talent. I think on the procurement side of things, particularly where there are governments involved, they can provide a penalty for those companies that won't employ women. And I think that's a legitimate use 
of government power to say we're not going to spend public money that is supported by tax payments made by women and others to support companies that are not providing um, contracts or not promoting women in the right way. So I think that that's a legitimate use of government power. But I'd also come back to my main point, which is that those companies that actually indulge in irrational preference against female talent, and it usually happens when women are going through the period of their lives where they do have this disproportionate issue around childcare. What they're going to find in the long run is that they're losing out on the war for talent because those women will come back, they will come back and make significant contributions if we can just change the work environment to allow them to get through that period. Thank you, thanks for that, Ken. Diazani, would you like to comment on some of the... Well, no, as he was talking, I was sort of thinking um, regarding the workplace and uh, penalties against uh, uh, um, uh, you know, people who don't um, hire a certain percentage of women. And you know, I was sort of thinking in my mind about the oil and gas sector, um, you know, which I sit on top of, which is highly capital intensive. So I was running through that in my mind. And we've had discussions um, recently on how we encourage you know, female participation in the sector. How, we, how do we actually get groups of women together uh, to show them the ways and means to begin to access financing, you know, even at the very basic level, to get into the vast scope of areas in the oil and gas sector, whether it's the supply areas, you know, or the, um, the Nigerian Content Initiative, which is a new act that gives first consideration to indigenous operators and marketers. Um, we have done some of that, of course, but we really do need to look, I think, as female um, leaders in the industry, well, in certain industries, or in all our industries, at how best we can um, support um, our, our fellow females in at least accessing um, these highly capital-intensive, highly technologically-driven um, sectors. And I think that in various ways and means this is possible as we are already uh, um, looking into. Okay. Mm. That's, that's good news. Hands are going up now. Okay, there's a lady at the back Hello. there. Uh, there were some gentlemen who already had the mic. We'll, we'll come back to you. So many. If I could ask everybody to keep it brief, we'll try to get through everyone. So the two ladies at the back, please. Let's start there. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. My name is Enase Okunedu. I'm chairperson. Association of African Business Schools and Dean of the Lagos Business School. My question is directed at um, the two gentlemen, the one from Merck and the one from ADB. And I'd like to ask what practices exist in the workplace to accommodate women given the roles that you have just described. Now, research shows that of every seven women who enter the workplace, because, especially in a typical African society, there's still very clear role definitions and gender stereotypes. Within five years, six of those women would have left. That's because the policies that are in place within the organization do not accommodate their taking time out, having their kids, coming back, mm -hmm. and then being able to progress. Thank you. So if you like, there is an, a discreet discrimination, not overt, but then workplace policies do not support or recognize the role. Therefore, my question is, what exists in your workplace you. to promote this? Thank you. Thank you. The lady next to you on the same row, I think. Very quickly, please, I'm going to ask you yes, to make it I brief. Yes, I will try. My name is Patricia Sisi. I run a management consulting firm, uh, Afiba, based in Dakar. And we also have a subsidiary in Avricos, which is active in financial advisory services. Um, we're really passionate about women. And uh, I would like to make a comment. All that we're saying here should not stay in the records. We have to take women in Africa as a continental cause. If we want to advance the continent, we have to make sure that women empowerment just doesn't stay a proof statement. If we want to diversify our economy, we need consumers. If women revenues increase, they will drive consumption. They will open up the African market. Uh, we've been trying to... I'm, I'm, uh, going, to, I'm going to no, stop you there. No, very quickly. Okay, very quickly. We've been trying to set up 
uh, 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 investment scheme for women SMEs, women-driven SMEs. Uh, everybody asks us, do you want to go into microfinance? Please, don't forget the women who are leading and running SMEs who need to be uh, brought in front. If you want to put a gender angle to procurement, let's make sure that the women who would accept that will be so uh, keen in delivering that they will not close the door for the others. Thank you. Thank, thank you. That's, you. That's a good point. Gentlemen I, I, here at the front, you've been waiting yes, a long time. Uh, thank you. I, I actually have a question. Um, I'm Paul Sutherland. I own Spirituality and Health magazine. We have about 90,000 readers. Most of them are women. And my mom taught women's studies, and she said, if you look at successful women, look at their relationship with their father. I would love to have each of you five women say, well, this is what my relationship was with your father. I'd love to understand that. Thank you so much. Um, yes, the hand's here now. Gentleman at the back there has been waiting. Then we'll come to the lady here uh, on the second row. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Laurie Lee from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Melinda Gates has said that she would not have been able to have a successful career as a Microsoft executive if she didn't have access to contraception so she could plan her family. I'd like to ask all of the members of the panel, including the men, whether that is also true of you. Would you have been able to be as successful in your careers without access to modern contraception? Well, that's a personal question. <laughs> Optional answers there. Thank you. The lady here at the, uh, in, the green, in the lovely green print dress. Thank you. My name is Ini Onuk. In 2004, I was still at the AU when the solemn declaration on gender equality was adopted by the African Union. After that, um, people like Benita Diop, I don't know if she's here, have fought much more, and we have the African Union gender policy. And then we have the African Union protocol on the rights of women in Africa. Today we're having a session again at the WEF on the issue of women, a, a side event which I didn't want to attend because it's the same rhetoric, if you will. At the level of the WEF, as we move away from here, we've talked about economic issues, we've talked about political engagement. What will the WEF on Africa do to make sure that this, we're sitting at the seat of the African Union? I worked at the African Union Gender Directorate for years. It's still the same fora. We come around, we talk about the issues, but the issues of trade, the issue of economic empowerment for women has to go beyond us talking about it. What are the practical steps? The same way we take our practical steps from the forum like this into considerable political will and change. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for that. I see two ladies here. Um, if the mic could come this way, then I'll come to Nkosana. Uh, there's a lady. Uh, Chinwe over here on the second row in the, and the lady behind in, in the white suit as well. Thank, Thank you, you, Julie. And mine is really quick and it's building on what um, my colleague said here. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the infamous statement made by Clarence Thomas several years ago. Who was that? Clarence, Clarence Thomas. Thomas. Yeah. Several years ago he said something about African Americans needing to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Um, similar to the question you asked. And so my question to the panel is for you to be on this panel the assumption is that you have done some work, particularly in the area of gender, or there's a special um, contribution that you've made. So I want to ask, in terms of mentoring, and um, Desiani said something about mentoring and how she was mentored, what are you doing? What specific steps have you taken, personally or professionally, to mentor women Thank and bring you. some women up? Thank you. Lady behind? Yes. Hi. Uh, is this working? Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christine Pearson from South Africa, and I'd like to mention three longitudinal studies that were undertaken in the U.S. because I think they may have some relevance to Africa. One is a long-term study of judges, and judges' rulings were significantly different if he had daughters. And the more daughters he had, the more sympathetic his rulings were towards women. Another one was 400 congressmen. The congressman's voting record was much more sympathetic to women's issues if he, had, if he had daughters. And thirdly, was a woman's career in, in corporate America was much more successful if she worked for men who had daughters and who had wives who also worked. Thank you. So, Thank you. That's very interesting. Come now to Kosana Moyo, who works with Grasha Michelle, so yes, can speak. <coughs> Kosana Moyo. 
I just want to build on a couple of observations. The first one is from uh, President Kaberuka, but we're all in this together. The second one, however, I think more critically, we need to understand the, the nature of the problem, the different facets, and, and shyly try to address each one of them. And one of the key elements of this problem is socialization. We call it tradition, we call it socialization, whatever. And I think the mistake we shouldn't make is to think that we're finding a solution for this generation. Because when it comes to socialization, the damage is done already to us. The people sitting in this room are beyond redemption. <laughs> but I think, I think therein lies a much more fundamental question. If we were taking responsibility for creating a different future, a different future, what are the issues we should be doing differently? And I've got a specific question. And it's not meant to be accusatory to the ladies sitting in this room. I've observed at very close quarters of my relatives their treatment of their daughters and their sons as mothers. And I think there is a big issue that ladies have to face up to. Because all of us have got mothers, as Julie pointed out. In the early stages of our lives, the socialization, rightly or wrongly, primarily depends on what the mother does. So why are you as mothers continuing to contribute to this particular issue? Thank you. I think That's it's a good question. point, but none of us is not, re we are all redeemable. Let me, let me, yes, please go ahead. The gentleman, the gentleman here, sorry, thank you. Well, my name is Unduka Baigbena of these day newspapers. Very simple question. Should women get appointed because they are women or because they are good? All of you here, I believe, you are in your positions because you are good. Should we be talking about equalization of opportunity or entitlement? Thank you. Thank May you. I address no. that? Yeah. May I'm, I address that? I okay, think we have in. to address that question. Everybody, no, our time is nearly up, so I will come. I will come. I will definitely come okay. to you. I'm going to give a young lady here the last, the last word from the participants, and then we are coming to the panel. Please go ahead. I apologize, Mr. Frazier. I'm going to jump in. I just had to answer that man really quickly. There are many studies that show that men are promoted on potential and women are promoted on performance. Thank you. Yes. That's Thank you. Unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you. So there's a gap in how we judge those things. Okay, Ken, over to you. Well, she actually took the words out of my mouth to some degree. I would just say for myself, and I tried to share this when I spoke, I think that there is the individual's merit but then there's also the relationships that exist within organizations. I, admit, I was quite frank to say I had very good relationships with the three CEOs before me, and I thought they invested in me. I think the reality of the world is that there are a lot of talented women who get completely stymied by organizations because they don't have the kinds of relationships. And it means that it is the responsibility of men in positions of power to take a chance on the women to give them those opportunities to stretch and grow because that's what most of us who've succeeded in the world have gotten from the people who come before us. It's not just performance. It's not just merit. It's also whether people are willing to invest in your career. Okay, thank you. Sheila, did you want to come in or can we? Yeah, no, no, yes. I just wanted very, to come in on, 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 both, on both issues. One, um, I, I, don't, I don't really buy the idea that, of bashing women. Where, where were the fathers of these children to nurture them into whatever it is that they wanted to be. Somebody wanted to ask the question, the relationship with my father. My, the relationship with my father was, you are as good as the next person, not the next man or the next boy. I had to do, to perform at the highest possible level, and it was my father, right? So if the fathers do their part, it can't just be the women. It's not the women only who socialize children. When the father goes off drinking, if I may say that, and the woman and comes back and demands food and, and bashes the woman, gender violence, the women are at the receiving end of that, and I don't want to support this idea that we are to blame for our own oppression all the time. I think together, again, together, men and women have to raise young people to know that they are equal to each other. It's Thank not you. girls to boys. Or be, or, and then on the issue of um, whether women 
uh, you know, have a right or are, are, are demanding a right they don't deserve, I don't hear you asking that about men. Yes. You know, I don't hear you. you men seem to have a right to be there. They have a right to, to positions. The, therefore, this, is, this is, panel, the question, is the question even is the valid if it doesn't gender, uh, apply gender on both balance, balance, balance. <laughs> No, Why no. didn't you ask that question with all these, okay. these, gen these uh, panels that were there before? Thank you, Sheila. They're because, all male. Because of, time, because of time, I'm going now to Charlotte, and we're going to come this way and wind up. Mo Monla, I will be with you in a moment. Um, go ahead, Monla. Go ahead, Monla, please. please. Oh, yes. I, I can. And then to you. Okay. Um, yeah. mm. I think we underestimate the importance of awareness. Um, there were some general questions about why talk shops, and I... It's unfortunate that um, my sister there, you're very tired of listening to many people talk about the same thing. However, awareness is key because we can all make a difference every square meter where we are. We can influence the people that we live with and make a difference. So for those who find this useful, it is about making a difference everywhere we are. In terms of the questions around, um, is it about equal? It's not about equal, it's about equity. It's about if on technical know-how, the boy and the girl are the same, how do you make choices for transformation when you are now going to appoint? Therefore, at that point in time, you will choose a girl because there is not a single skirt in your team for transformation. Um, and then what are we doing personally to actually sit here and bore you with all these ideas when, in fact, we don't have a track record. I think you could take a chance on all the women here to realize that it is two things. Partly is because of what we have done and what we are learning to try and find a sharing platform to learn from you. And number two, to try and get ourselves to be more aware so that our square meters become much better and much more conducive for boys and girls to be much more creative. And um, on the more personal issues about relationships with fathers, mm. I do realize that it's a very important issue, actually. There's a lot of studies done on it. However, because of our limited time, it is not possible to actually deal with that one-on-one, -on -one, including the issue of whether or not uh, you, know, you find using a contraceptive as a very key um, <laughs> right. factor to how you got to where you are, to not belittle it. Because I think it's not really about whether you use contraception. It's about whether or not delaying childbirth could actually give an opportunity for a woman at a point in time. It's a valid question. Mm -hmm. I wish we had more time to look at it. For me personally, it is not about being here at a talk shop on the World Economic Forum and what should be done. It's about actually finding a way for us African women to do something about what we know. The more many of us are in leadership roles, the challenge is what we do with our square meters, including sitting in the World Economic Forum. Let's sometimes realize that it's about finding each other than about expecting someone else to do it. But the World Economic Forum provides a great platform. <clears throat> if there was an opportunity for a better platform for us to engage on trade and to engage in, in, in more business ways for women to be involved from SMME, to cooperate, it would be great. It's, it's about finding each other. That's powerful. Charlotte, let me come to you yes, as we come I, I down. Yes, I do agree that there's been a lot of talk shops, but I think the talk shops are important, if only to remind us that those of us who have the, the privilege and the opportunity to be educated, men and women in Africa, about how we can make a change rather than waiting for African governments. As Commissioner for Civic Education in Ghana, there's a lot I think I can do. If I start by remembering that I not only represent myself, I represent other women. So what I do, I have a staff of 1,760. I'm the first female commissioner they've had. So I'm the first one who has actually sat down to look at the numbers and say, we have so many women, why aren't they at the top? And I'm working at actively bringing women to the top. I run 850 civic education clubs in secondary schools and universities in Ghana. And immediately what I noticed was that if you go into the executives of the clubs. The men, the boys are always a president, secondary school. Boy will be a president, boy will be a vice president. If you're lucky, there'll be a young girl who is treasurer or secretary. And I've started changing that. I'm like, 
you know what, we need to have the girls up there as well. Let's shake this up a bit. So it's the little things we can do, the little steps we can take each day. And of course, if we come to a forum like this, and it just reminds us of our responsibilities, and we go back home and start socializing our children differently, I think it would make a difference eventually. Uh, Donald, because time is so short, you can choose the critical issues if you want to, to handle any, just to wrap up. Thank you, mm -hmm. thank you, Julie. Uh, first of all, on this issue of talk, uh, there's too much talk about Africa, about development, about gender. Frankly, I think that is the right thing to do. Uh, among freedom fighters, they have uh, a saying that uh, fight as you talk. So, to keep talking about these things has its own importance. To keep them active on the agenda, but to know that the implementation is not yet done. So for me, I'm happy to come to these talk uh, shops, as you call them, but also to insist that things are done. Exactly. Number two, Julie, somebody asked, what did we do to merit to be on this panel? Ah, we didn't choose ourselves. <laughs> but uh, in my case, look, I have two interests, first of all. I'm a leader. I'm an African leader, and these things are important for us. Number two, I'm a father of two girls. So, I'm interested in the future of these girls. And I think each one of us has a right to have a say on these issues. Look back at the pictures of the Arab Spring. Me, I live in Tunisia. Just go back, look at those pictures. Look at the number of boys and girls side by side fighting for freedom. Go back to those pictures. They tell a the story. And for me, that's why I stand. Now, on the issue of uh, the issue you raised, um, you know, these discussions should never dilute individual responsibilities before society or before the law. I tell you in my country, there are many women now before justice or in prison or under the auspices of the International Court of Justice because these women participated in genocide in my country, killing other women, killing girls, killing men. Now, those have to assume individual responsibilities before the law, before society, and before God. And I think we should never mix those two because then we also dilute this other element or that each one of us has his or her individual responsibilities for which they must always answer. Thank you so much. Sheila, did you wind up? Any final, give us a final statement. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, no, I, I, think, I think we've covered uh, most of the things. The, the point about talk shops, my sister, uh, what I would agree with you about is that this issue should be up and in every panel that the WEF discusses and get special attention. So both things should happen together. That we cannot have, as we've had, all the panels I attended in this hall were only men. And women were an afterthought if somebody raised the question from the floor. Mm -hmm. So I would say to the World Economic Forum, not only to have women for show, but as you conceptualize discussions in the future, you yourself as the World Economic Forum, insert in those deliberations, engage, engage fully what women. about women? Right. Yep. Thank you so much. Ken, over to so you. So let me close by first of all thanking you all for your very generous listening today. I share the frustration that some people have expressed that we sit here in 2012 having to have these conversations about women and diversity. We never have these conversations. Nobody ever has to justify homogeneity. That's the norm. And I think as long as the norm is that men should be there, we will not even see the picture. It's solipsism. It's, it's the way it's always been. It's the way it's always going to be. I'd like to believe that there are enough people of goodwill and enough corporations who understand how rare it is to find truly great talent that over the next few years, we will start to see many more women CEOs. Because if women are 50% of the workforce, there's no excuse for them to be less than 5% of the CEOs. Yeah. Tia Sani, over to you. Let me run through these very quickly. Relationship with your father. I'm not sure where that's going, but mine was very strong. <laughs> Access to contraception, no, not at all. It was a very robust support framework that I had, mostly from family. The support you get from mothers, from sisters, 
from a husband who is confident enough to allow you to go out and do what you have to do, and even from your sons. Treatment of daughters versus their sons, I don't think you need to ask me that question. I think it should be obvious. <laughs> should women get appointed because they're a woman? Of course, they're good. We expect that as women work their way up the ladder, their progress is based on their competence. But they must be given the enablement to get their foot in the door in the first place at many levels. And of course, special contributions. Well, I think I discussed that already um, in a number of ways. But let me just turn this on its head uh, a little bit in, in closing and say this that I think that um, leaving the men aside as women, particularly as women that are progressing up the ladder and are in major leadership positions, I think the onus is actually on us to look behind us and draw every woman as much as we can up by their bootstraps and to go into policies in our own areas of business, whether it be public or private, or pr private sector, to ensure that we do create those enabling policies and supportive policies that will work for women long, long after we are gone. Thank you so much. You. Um, we're just wrapping up now, and I just want to give a final word and respond to some of the issues. My relationship with my father, a military man, an Asian, from a community that culturally have pushed women down, was excellent. He empowered me, and it was wonderful. Um, I also feel the issue of mentorship is critical. And I want to encourage every woman who's attended this session and is building her career to almost break through the challenges. In fact, for me, I didn't see gender challenges. I just plowed ahead. And I'm sure a lot of women will, here will say, if they're not listening to you, speak louder. Speak more, even louder until they hear you. And that's, that's I think, you know, just get on with it is what uh, the lady said from uh, Nigeria and I totally agree with that. Ladies, let's start to get on with it and let's start to network and also encourage the male uh, relatives, friends, co-workers, bosses to come along with us for the ride. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Good afternoon.